all righty, matt. one of the big ones that we've had a lot of people with a lot of questions online about is the brand new status, the e three s so that has replaced the e three or it has upgraded the e three d dependent status for E3 spouses and, and kids. Um, can you give us, a, a again, a 30,000 foot view of what, what is this new status and, and what does it mean? Absolutely. So just to clarify, it's, it's the E3D, it still exists. So you have the E3DS. Okay, cool. So if you're yep. a child of an E3, that's the E3D. E3D, the S designation is, is sort of the operative designation that gives what's known as uh, work authorization incident to status. Okay. So somebody in the E3, their work authorization is incident to status. There's no other, you know, follow-up application required. They come so come, the comes E3. with comes with the status, comes with the stamp. Exactly. They're here in the E3, they can start work. That's what they need, you know, to get uh on board with payroll and their employer and all those things. Sorry, just to clarify, they're here on the E3. S, not here on the E3, right? Right. No, but um, so when you're here in the E3, it's the same thing. That's that's you have the E3 has employment authorization incident to status. Understood. Understood. Sorry. Right. 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 Yes. Now yes, been yes. extended to the E3 DS, where it's basically the same. You have your employment authorization is just it's tied into your E3 DS status. There's no other supplemental application required, or like there used to be. So little backstory, what happened is, as I'm sure a lot of you are well aware, the processing times for this employment authorization for people with the spousal E3 was taking forever. And it was a, it was like a joke. I mean, it was taking, used to be a couple months, it became six like months, 12, seven months, yeah, six, 12 minutes, months yeah. a year plus. And yeah. you're only even allowed to apply up to six months in it. So if you're here extending, you have to apply within six months of the expiration. So it created a situation where people were literally not able to have the work authorization that they were you know, legally entitled to. So because of that, a lot of immigration lawyers got together to file a basically big lawsuit and it was successful. And it was really an amazing moment um, because that's that's now this is the result is that there's this E3DS and it's and the same with the L, the L2. Um, people that are in the L1 spouses have authorization incident to status. Um, and it was a big victory, it was a big moment, but now, um, and maybe we'll get to this. Is, is we're seeing some some problems with the implementation and the rollout. <laughs> so yeah, it's for the spouses of E3 uh, people who are entering on an E3. It's for their spouses. Do you actually get an E3S visa, or do you get an E3D visa and then enter? Like what what's the deal? Where where does this S come into the whole process? Yeah, that's that's a good question because and again, so this is all within like the last year essentially. So like any big change, it's it's being kind of implemented piece by piece and, and not very consistently across the board. Um, <laughs> shocking, shocking. Yeah, I know. <laughs> the the key what what really matters is that your I-94 record of entry that everyone gets when they enter the US and then you can look up online using your passport detail. It's important that that I-94 record of entry says E3DS because maybe they write something, you know, in your, in your passport, um, you know, maybe your visa stamp just says E3D, but what you need is for your I-94 record of entry to say E3DS because that's what you're going to use for I-9 compliance and for payroll and things like that. So is it E3DS or E3S or both? Or E3DS. One? E3DS. E3DS. Okay, got it. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. And so the, yeah, that's the one. So the I-94 is effectively the new version of the stamp in your passport. It's the, some people will still get a physical stamp, but you'll definitely have an electronic like I-94 number um, that's, that's registered to you. So even if you're holding an E3D visa, so if the, the sticker in your passport says D, when you arrive, What's the process there? Do you request it? Like, I, I know that sometimes there's been some confusion because officers might not know that it's an option that a person could get, and that's causing yeah. a little bit of tension at the gate. So, and just to clarify also, like, there are I-94s that say E3S. So okay. I've seen E3DS, <laughs> I've seen E3S. Um, it's because chaos. Again, it was unclear at first because they were talking about, oh, this S. But the, the S is what's important. Just remember that, okay? S, sure. If there's an S, S somewhere, it's good. Yeah. So... If you come and if you enter, a lot of what we're seeing, a lot of people, they're, they're being admitted and they're being given the sort of the E3D status. 
which they shouldn't be. They should be given the E3S or the E3DS. So you can you can contact what's known as deferred inspection and answer a series of answer a series of questions, and um, they'll 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 change it. Um, and that kind of you know just it's worth noting that goes for any um, error in your I ninety four. Anybody that comes here, no matter what your situation is, you want to check your I ninety four record of entry. That's the most important thing you can do. You need to make sure you admit it in the right status. You need to make sure that you're given the correct end date because that's what you know. That's their record of your end date. So you need to check that if you're in. If you weren't given the E3S, you need to contact deferred inspection, answer a series of you know identification questions, and say I was incorrectly admitted, and they'll change it. Usually they'll do it over the phone. You can even try and do it over email. But if that doesn't work, you just go in. Um, and, and maybe it isn't even in the the specific airport that you entered, there's a list of, of the sites and you go to the closest one. If, if it doesn't work over phone and email, and then you just go in person and get them to sort it out for you because you're entitled to that employment authorization. Okay, cool. So is it worth bringing up at the gate or is it not really worth the argument? It's just sort of like hand your passport over and, and whatever happens, happens, and then use deferred inspection. Is that sort of the easier path, the best path? No, I would, because the reality is, it's there's a training gap, and there, and you know, there's a likelihood that the officer doesn't really know, and that's why people are admitted incorrectly. So, that that's actually though, it's a bit of a personal question because a lot of people they just want to be done with the whole thing, um, because again, it's it's actually really not that hard to get it fixed in deferred inspection. It's not like if you're admitted, oh, you know, that's it, you know. You can get it fixed. So, but some people maybe they're they're there. And they're just going to say, "Hey, I want to just make sure that I'm I'm correctly admitted now." So that's kind of up to whoever you know is doing it. But yeah. So if you're feeling confident on the day, you could potentially just sort of say, "Like, hey, I just want to make sure." But then if it's getting tense, or if you know if you don't want to worry about that, you can just go in, take the stamp, and then uh, and work it out. Is there a time limit for deferred inspection? Is there you know you have to do the change within a certain amount of time? to get that change done or is it, it as long as it's kind of done relatively quickly? Yeah. I don't actually know that it has to be that quick. I, I do feel like most things, you know, sooner is always better than, than later, especially if you're trying to, you know, start working and things like that. But I actually had a, a deferred inspection. I actually contacted deferred inspection for a client to have them because they, they gave this, this client a sort of a, abbreviated I-94 end date and, and we were doing a case for them and I was like, wait a minute, they, they, they should have a longer date. And this was, I mean, it was over a year after they came in. It was kind of during COVID. Um, and so I just, I called them up and I had them bump it back and then it, it worked and it was great. <laughs> um, so, you know, it, I, you know, again, you're, it, it's usually the correct an error that they made. Right. So, they're they're pretty flexible, especially during. I mean, even though I guess not, we're not like really in the height of the pandemic anymore. But there, we've just seen some flexibility in surprising places throughout all these different processes. Yeah, I must say the response that I've had from referring people to deferred inspection, it has to be one of the like most efficient processes yeah. I've seen in the whole this whole immigration space because they seem, as you said, in general, most people get it corrected right on the phone. They'll respond to emails within a day and say, yep, verified, like we've updated you to the right status or we've extended the date. So it isn't a complicated process. It should be relatively easy. So again, that is an easy way to fix any issues. And it is very important that every, that uh, sort of, so I've just inspired my own next question. The the I ninety four gets done every time you enter, right? So you need to check it every time you enter the US. So even if you've come in, started work on an E three DS, everything's great, all's going well. If you go on holiday or go back to Australia or whatever, and you re-enter the US, you potentially have to go through that process again. That's correct. Yeah, you got to check it every time because it's a new record every time. Um, you know, you'll have a new I ninety four number because it's you know the, 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 it's your I ninety four number, most recent date of admission, class of admission, admit until date, and then your sort of biographical passport details. So that's what your I ninety four is, and you know everyone can check their own. It's just the right habit to have if if you come, you know, back to the U S. from international travel, and you just yeah, need to make great. sure it's it's all good. 
We've clarified what the E3DS is, and that means that, as you said, you don't need to do any extra paperwork. So the EAD or the work authorization or the I-765 forms, they all, if you've been admitted with the E3DS or if you're the spouse of an E3 holder, that all goes out the window. You just need entrance with an I-94 that has E3DS. And in theory, True. that should mean you can just start work. We have one of the sort of obviously first steps for people once they come into the US and they have work authorization because of this new status or because they've got a, an E3 themselves, they need to go to the social security office. And True. as you said, this is a huge laborious process to get this new thing initiated. We've seen a few issues there, right? Yeah, that's right. And it's it's kind of caused a lot of confusion for us because because clients, so we've, we've had clients that, that come and say, hey, gone to the social security office. I've shown them the I-94 I've, and we tend to have them bring the USCIS updates that when, where they've made the announcements that EAD is not required anymore. And then they come in and say, Hey, well, they actually, they told me I needed to file an I-765 and then, which is just, it's wrong. You know, That's obviously the work it's, authorization. It's, yeah. Document. I need work authorization. Yep. So there's a training gap with, with the social security officers that we've noticed it's been sort of brought to our attention by a client recently. And then I've reached out and communicated this to other immigration lawyers and they're saying, Hey, wait a minute, like this is, this happened to us too. And there's these sort of isolated incidents all over the country where social security offices are not issuing the, you know, the social security number They're they're just, they're improperly trained. And so there's a American immigration lawyer sort of government liaison government relations component and they're gathering all these different reports and they're going to try and, and and just make sure that this doesn't happen anymore um we we sort of see it again anecdotal it seems to happen more in some of the kind of smaller more um rural or isolated locations you probably, probably um, get fewer people coming through with different exactly. situations like this yeah exactly yeah it's just it's just kind of new and um, and, you know, I feel bad because we've had people go back, you know, two or three times and they're just kind of spinning their wheels and they're, again, they're entitled, you know, it was litigation that, that brought this as a, is as, as an option now and they're entitled to it. And hopefully we can kind of just get it sorted out without having to resort to litigation again. Um, but we're kind of on, you know, we're, this is a work in progress and, and we're seeing kind of what's happening right now in real time in terms of these reports being gathered and, and sort of processed with the, with the information in the different locations where this is happening. But, you know, hopefully they're going to roll it out and do a bit better job with the training and implementation. Yeah. So in the meantime, printing out the, there's, I know I've got a link on my website um, that has the link to the social security release. Um, and I think I've got the USCIS release as well. So yep. both of those documents you can physically print out and walk yep. in and, it, you know, I, as sort of I always advise people, like, keep a level head, be cool about it. It is sort of a, unfortunately, a lack of, like, training for some of the officers and they just don't know. But if yeah. you take it in and it's their official documentation, you can point them to the right subsection of the right form and, and sort of lead them to the point where they should, you should be able to walk out. I know that I've had a few people that even doing that, it's been a bit of a, a struggle. But in yeah. general, that's sort of the advice is, like, go in with a bit of evidence and, and try your, try again. Absolutely. Yeah, you, you definitely want the printed I-94 and, and you should bring the announcements that you've referenced um, another on your website because it doesn't hurt. And it's, you know, it, it, it's just it's it helps going into that situation to have something to show these people that clearly not everyone even really knows. Think places, you know, in New York, Los Angeles, New York City. You know, I think you can kind of assume those are officers that deal with this a lot. And um, you, it's probably not necessary but why not you know you're only talking about a couple pieces of paper just print them up bring them with you and um you know it'll help you feel better if nothing else yeah i actually had someone this morning tell me that their employer wanted to see another form of work authorization and again the advice was the same it's like take those documents show them that like you know you've got the right status in your own 94 you've got the right status per the USCIS and, and social security requirements. And you have a card that just like an E3, it, your social security card will say, uh, I think subject to DHS authorization, but that you you have that because as you said earlier, Matt, that's your incident to status. So if you've come in with the right status, you have the ability to work. It's just a matter of uh, getting all those ducks in a row. 
and yeah, and I would also just say if you're watching um, and and this happens to you to let one of us know or Josh or myself. I mean, just because we 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 want that data, it's it's really important to gather and synthesize these these incidents because you know there were mechanisms and we're we're, we're actively working on this to kind of just make sure it doesn't happen. Like I said, we have American immigration lawyer, government relations kind of liaison um, groups that that really want this data and um, we'll make sure it gets into the right hands so, so that we can keep it from happening. Okay, yeah, feel free to email one of us um, or we'll have a form online so that people can submit their information. Yeah. Cool.